This lecture will be on convolutional neural network. A very uh, powerful uh, structure in image processing and uh, working with text in many areas, you know, uh, used to be a state of the art uh, up to a couple of years ago. It's still very popular a structure in many cases. Okay, um, what's the difference between convolutional neural network and feedforward neural network that we uh, have seen before? Uh, a convolutional neural network is a network which at least has one convolutional layer. And convolutional layer has three stages. Convolutional stage, detector stage, and pooling stage. So in feedforward neural network, we have matrix multiplication between one layer and the other layer. And after matrix multiplication, we have uh, we apply activation function, which is basically some sort of nonlinearity, right? So instead of matrix multiplication, we do convolution here. And then we'll see that detector stage is basically applying activation function, so it is the same. And pulling is something new, which we'll learn about in this. So any network that has at least one convolutional layer, and convolutional layer is a layer consists of these three stages, is called convolutional neural network. So instead of uh, matrix multiplication, we do convolution. Uh, what is convolution? Convolution, actually, you are familiar with convolution. Convolution, you have two functions, uh, x and w. And through convolution, you find a third function. By convolving these two functions, basically, you're sliding. <laughs> You have two functions, x and w, and you are basically, um, the way that convolution works is that you flip one of these functions, you uh, slide it over the other function, and then take this integral, okay? So it might be easier to see it in a discrete case. You flip one function, w, and then you slide it over uh, the other function, x, and then take summation from negative infinity to plus infinity, okay? So it's pretty, uh, I mean, we can do convolution in uh, like a discrete case. You can do it in continuous domain. You can do it in one dimension or multi-dimension. So the convolution can be defined in multi-dimension, like in two dimension instead of one dimension. So if you have two dimensional signals, you can convolve them. Uh, it has a close relation with another operator, which is cross-correlation. And the difference between convolution and cross-correlation, by definition, is that, you know, in cross-correlation, you don't have this negative. It's plus. So basically, you don't mirror, you don't flip uh, one signal. You just, uh, you know, slide it over the other signal and then take the summation. That's cross-correlation. If you flip it and then slide, it's convolution. What we are doing in neural network is in fact cross-correlation. It's not quite clear to me why they call this convolution. It's not convolution because we don't flip a signal. We just um, slide one signal, which is we call it kernel or filter over another one and then take summation. So it is in fact cross-correlation. Technically it's not convolution, but uh, it's common to call it convolution, okay, in the literature of neural net. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see the difference between 
see the difference between uh, convolution and cross correlation. We have these two signals, and in cross correlation, you slide one of these signals or the other one, and then take the summation. So when what you see here is the resulting function of sliding one of these signals over the other one and then they take the summation from negative infinity to plus infinity. So in, in here from negative one to plus one. Okay, so that's cross correlation. In uh, convolution, we flip, see, we flip this one. And then we do exactly the same thing that we did for uh, cross correlation. So the difference between cross correlation and convolution is that in one in one of them, you first flip the signal in convolution. You first flip the signal and then you slide it over the other one. And in cross correlation, you do not flip. You just slide it over the other one. So um, what is this good for, or what's the intuition actually behind? doing uh, cross-correlation or uh, more technically, uh, I mean, convolution or more technically cross-correlation. Let me uh, show you Okay, um, Okay. suppose that we have these two signals and I want to perform cross-correlation between them. So what is cross-correlation? Cross-correlation is basically uh, 2.76 times 0 0.36 plus negative 1.35 times 3.6 and so on. So at time zero, when these two functions have no uh, lag with respect to each other, that's what the uh, uh, cross correlation is. Then I start to shift one of these signals as at time t plus one say. I'm gonna shift it one step forward and then I will calculate this uh, operation. Uh, okay, so I calculate this again. So that was step zero, 7.6. At the step one, it is 7.8. Then at the step two, it's 19.41. Uh, 19.41 is a large number compared to 7.84. And if you look at these two signals at this time step, there is a similarity between these two signals, uh, a sort of similarity that we didn't have in the previous time step. You know, this part of the signal and this part of the signal is basically quite similar to the other one or it's identical to the other one. So we get a large number as a cross correlation, right? If I keep going, uh, so negative five, so it's pretty dissimilar at this time step, you know? That one is like uh, going up, this one going down. So they have in a very, very different direction. And I can calculate this in uh, basically all time steps, also for, for negative time steps from negative one, from minus infinity to plus infinity. And you can appreciate the fact that at any time step, 
if they're similar to each other, you're going to get a, a large cross correlation value. And if they are not similar, if they're dissimilar, you get a small cross correlation uh, value. So basically, cross correlation, you can think of this as a way of measuring similarity between two signals. So at which time step they are similar or they are dissimilar to each other, okay? So this could be uh, a useful tool. Let me show you uh, another. with that. Okay. okay um. No, I have this image, 2,000 by 1,000. And I have another image, which is basically uh, 3 by 3. Okay. And I want to convolve them. In fact, I want to find the cross-correlation between them. So from now on, when I say convolve, I mean cross-correlation. I mean, that's what they mean by convolve in the literature of neural network. So I want to convolve them. And we saw in the previous example that when you convolve two signals, large values shows uh, similarity and small values shows the similarity. So if I convolve this one with this image, you're going to get this. Then don't know how visible this image is to you. Is it or no? No? L let me, let's, let's turn the light off. Maybe it's better. Do you see? Okay. So uh, you're going to see this. This is another signal which I'm going to convolve. And you're going to see this. Do you see any difference between these two? What if, you know, this is, this signal, or this image, is something similar to edge, because what is edge? Edge is basically contrast between two colors, right? So a contrast between white and gray, or a contrast between gray and black. That's what the edge is, right? And I'm convolving this with the image, so it's supposed, I mean, large value is supposed to give me the similarity. So similarity of this image and this image is where the edges appear, right? So it's sort of edge detector, you know, if I look at this, you know, it, it, it omitted, removed many details of this two elephants. But I have, you know, a scratch of the shape, you know, the edges. 
But this is horizontal edges compared to this one, which is vertical edges. And if I combine them, I'm going to see this. So it may be I can show you another example. Maybe this one. See, that's the original image. And when you convolve it with this one, you're going to just see the horizontal lines. And you convolve it with this one, you're going to see only vertical lines. And then you combine these two, you're going to see all edges either horizontal or vertical. Okay. Uh, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So in, in convolutional neural network, that's what, I mean, you can turn the, the light on. So in convolutional neural network, that's what we always do. You know, this is called filter or this is called kernel. Suppose that you have an image as the input and you're convolving this image with a kernel. And the resulting output is called feature map. Okay, that's what's happening in the first stage, convolutional stage. You know, convolutional layer had three stages. First was convolutional stage. So that's what's happening in convolutional stage, that you convolve a kernel or a filter to your um, image and that the resulting output is called feature map. Actually, not quite because then you have to apply a nonlinearity to it and then call it feature map. Um, with the exception that this kernel is not known ahead of time, you know. You're going to convolve a kernel with an image, but the kernel is unknown. You're going to learn the kernel. That's the parameters of the model. In feedforward neural network, we are learning weights, right? You do matrix multiplication from one layer to another layer, but the elements of kernel, elements of the matrix is unknown. You have to learn it through backpropagation. Now you're convolving a kernel to an image but the elements of this kernel is unknown. You have to learn it through backpropagation. So these are my parameters. So uh, <clears throat> that's how it works. You have an image as the input of your neural network. And uh, we are talking about images because neural network, origi I mean, conversion neural network originally designed to work with images. But in fact, you can work with text, you can work with speech, you can work with all type of data using convolutional neural network. So you have an image and then you have a kernel. I represent these kernels by red. You know, the kernel is one zero one zero one zero. So I assume that the kernel is noun, but in fact, you know, this kernel, you have to learn it. But convolving this kernel with the image means that <clears throat> I multiply the kernel to the values, the pixel values. So one times one, zero times one, one times one, zero times zero, one, one, and then sum them up. So that's going to be four. This is <coughs> the uh, convolution of this kernel with this image. And then you're going to shift the kernel to the right and then convolve it again. And it's going to be three and then shift it again. Shift it down. And this way you're going to find convolved feature. 
convolve feature could be the same size of images if you want to. And the way to do it is to uh, <clears throat> basically extend this image and add some zeros, for example, to the image or copy the image itself to make the convolved image the same size. But usually it's not. Okay. So, uh, so far we explained the uh, first stage based on the convolutional operator. Now I want to tell you that it is in fact pretty similar of fit forward uh, operation with two exceptions. One is that it's fit forward with sparse weights and the other one is that this sparse weights have been tied and have shared values. Okay, so, uh, you know, suppose that uh, you have a fit forward neural network and in, in your fit forward neural networks you have some You have some nodes, and in the next step, next layer, you have some other nodes. Fit forward is fully connected, you know, any node to any node. And that's why it can be represented by matrix uh, multiplication. But assume that it's not fully connected, so the way that it works is that this is connected to this, this is connected to this, and uh, I compute a weight for this, and I compute a weight for this, okay? And then I connect this one to this, and this one to this. And then I connect, uh, this one to this, and this one to this, for example, right? So it's not fully connected. <clears throat> and I use exactly the same way that I used here. And exactly the same way that uh, I used here. So we had an, a large image and then we had a small kernel going through all image uh, over, over the image multiplied to the values of the image sum, right? So it's exactly the same thing. That's your image. That's a part of the image. In this case, the size is two. In our example, the size was like three by three or four by four. So the size is two and this is your kernel right? So multiply the kernel with this value and take summation. And then you uh, basically slide the kernel over. So slide the kernel and do exactly with the exact same values and do it for this one and then slide the kernel, do it exactly for this one and take the summation, right? These are the summations. So in this sense, it's exactly the same as fit forward neural network, with the exception that it's not it's sparse. And again, remember that I told you bet on sparsity. You know, always I, sparsity is always a good thing if you can do. <coughs> so it's a sparse, and weights are shared. You know, I'm not going to learn new weights for this one or new weights for this one. I have some constraint as if I have some constraint, that's exactly the same weight, okay? So that's convolution step. Convolution step is fit forward, which is sparse and tight weights. And the next step, which is detector, is exactly 
what we had in neural network apply and uh, fit for apply nonlinearity to it. Okay, so we do the same thing. Yes. Uh, suppose that you have learned the kernel, you know, you're learning a kernel. What's the interaction of this kernel and the original image now? If you just, after it learned, you know, if you just multiply, or how do you learn it? You initialize with some value. At the first stage that you initialize it, what's the interaction between these two? If you just multiply and sum, it's correlation, right? Cross correlation. It's not technically, it's not convolution. Okay. Any other question? Okay. <clears throat> so we have sparse interaction. Uh, and we share parameters. Okay, something important here is uh, a property. I mean, this is the definition of equivalence with, for function f and g. So if uh, f of gx is g of fx, then you would say that f is equivalent to g. You know, g of x, this is g of x. And then you apply f to it, you're going to get y. If you apply f to x and then apply g, you get to the same, uh, you know, point. Then if, if you have this property between two functions, you would say that these two functions are uh, basically have, have this property of being uh, equivalent. So in convolution, uh, translation and convolution are equivalents. Means if I translate and then convolve, it's the same as convolve and translate. Why this is important? Because, uh, you know, first see what, what, what it says. Um, you know, this, I have this function. And say I want to convolve it with a uh, step function with uh, like a spike, right? So what's going to happen? Everywhere it's going to be zero except at this point, right? So I'm going to see the signal here, not anywhere else, if I convolve with this one. Uh, if I had this spark in, in different places, then I had the signal that in that place. So if my signal say has this form, then I'm gonna see this signals. Right? So basically um, the property that we, uh, if I translate and then convolve is the same as convolve and then translate. Help me to discover the same features of, say, an image, regardless of their location. So in the image of elephants, for example, I have a edge at this part, or I have edge at this part. So it's as if 
I had some properties here and then translate them to this place. Okay, when I'm doing convolution, it's as if I'm doing convolution on this, which is capturing the property, showing me the edges, and then translate. Okay, so translate and then convolution means it's the same as convolution and then translate. So if if same property appears in different locations of this image, uh, this this process will capture it the same way that it captured here. It captured somewhere else. Okay. But it's not equivalent to all transformation. You know, it's equivalent to translation. It's not equivalent to rotation. It's not equivalent to sharing. It's not a quantum to many different things. Scaling. It's not a quantum to those. So if you have the same features but it's rotated a little bit, you can't capture it through convolution. If you have the same feature but it, it has been, I don't know, uh, rescaled, you can't capture it through convolution. So, but this property is important property working for translation but doesn't work for all transformation. Okay, so I told you that in convolutional layer we have three steps or three stages. So convolutional stage, then detector stage, and then pooling stage. Detector stage is the same as applying activation function in feed forward neural network. It's exactly the same. So uh, after the convolutional stage, you are going to have some uh, convolved features, you apply some non some nonlinearity to, and this nonlinearity could be exactly the same of, of nonlinearity that we have in feed forward. Could be sigma, it could be hyperbola, it could be relu, and then we have pooling stage, <coughs> which is new. Okay, pooling basically means returning some. Uh, statistics of the data instead of the data itself. Statistic of the data means average of the data, max of the data, L2 norm of the data, some, something like that. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> After uh, convolution, I have this uh, convolved features. Then I apply nonlinearity to it. And after applying nonlinearity to it, we call it a, a feature map. I have this feature map. And it has some values. Say, for example, uh, it is uh, 0, 2, um, 1, 5. Okay. So in pooling, I'm going to look at this. 0, 2, 1, 5, and return a statistics of the 0, 2, 1, 5. For example, I'm going to return the average of them. So 1 plus 5, 6 plus 2, 8, divided by 4 is 2. So I'm going to return 2. And then I'm going to slide my window here or with two steps, depends on what I want to do, and then return the average here. It could be max, 0, 2, 1, 5, the maximum is 5. 
So it depends on the operator that I'm using here. It has, we have different type of pooling. It's called uh, max pooling. Max pooling is pretty popular. Uh, it could be L2 pooling. Could be average pooling, you know, different type of pooling. And in pooling, you can either down sample, means for each these four, you know, you report five, or exactly the same as what, you, what I told you before, you can add some zeros to your feature map or just copy your feature map, extend it, and do pooling but with the same size, okay? I'm going to show you some advantages of, advantage of pooling by pooling could be important, in, I mean, useful. But in fact, this is pretty controversial step in convolutional neural network. And some researchers believe that everything is okay in convolutional neural network except this part. I mean, you shouldn't do pooling. Uh, there's a interesting video, if you want to search, by Jeffrey Hinton, what's wrong with convolutional neural network. And it's, it's pretty intuitive talk, you know, it's not mathematical talk, but I encourage you to look at this. And uh, one of the things which is, is wrong from his point of view is pooling. And he explained why. Uh, and his attempt to, to correct this was what's called a capsule network. That was his attempt, basically, to fix this problem with convolutional neural network, capsule network. With apparently, I mean, it was, it, it, it got lots of attention, even news coverage when it was proposed. But I'm not seeing any use of this after a while. No, I mean, no, that, that's quite natural, right? I mean, you come up with something and then uh, it should be, you have to put it in practice and see how it works. So something theoretically on paper intuitively works and in practice doesn't and vice versa. And uh, so it, it seems that it was not a successful structure in practice. But that was his attempt to, to fix this problem. Or the, 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 the structure was called capsule net. Okay, uh, the, the, the pulling stage works this way. You know, suppose that this is the output of detector stage. Means I, I have computed my convolved features and then I applied the nonlinearity to it, okay? Then pulling could be the same size. In this case, say for example, I have max pulling. I'm taking, taking the maximum of three uh, nodes here. The maximum of these three nodes w is one. The maximum of these three nodes, 0 0.1, 1, 0 0.2 is one. And the maximum of these three is one. And the maximum of these three is 0 0.2. So this is my, the value of network in pooling stage. Okay. And you can do it with down sampling. I mean, here, the pooling stage has the same um, dimension as your detector stage, as your feature map, but you can do pooling stage with down sampling. In this case, when I take the max of these three, then I will move and take the max of these three. So the, the size of my uh, pooling stage is, is smaller. So I do pooling with down sampling, okay? Before I explain the advantage of this pooling, uh, if you want to think of the potential advantage of this, what do you think? Or suppose that you designed convolutional neural network. So you came with this, I mean, the only neural network that people use is foot forward neural network and you have an idea, right? 
you're Jan LeCun who came up with convolutional neural network and you come up with this idea and you think that, okay, well, wait a minute, and instead of having like a dense uh, matrix multiplication between these two layers, I'm going to do something sparse and share weights. And it, this is in fact convolutional operator and convolutional operator cross correlation can capture the similarity between my kernel and my uh, image. And then, uh, so it's a good thing, you know, I can basically learn these kernels and capture useful features. Then, okay, so far everything makes sense. Now, why you should think that, okay, after that I'm going to do pooling. Downsample them, for example, or whatever. Take a statistics of this feature map instead of the feature map itself. Sorry? Dimensionality reduction. In fact, in, I, I'm sorry? Computational efficiency. I'm not, I, I'm not Jan Lekon, and I don't know what, what he, he, he taught at that time. But I think the main motivation was computational efficiency, you know, that don't have strong computers and feature maps are large. Let's downsample them, you know, and instead of working with data. But it turned out that <clears throat> it's going to be, be useful in some cases beyond what was the intuition or what was the original reason of making the computation more efficient. Something which I didn't explain maybe quite well here is that we don't learn only one kernel from one layer to another layer. You know? You have uh, you have an image, and uh, so you know. Let's come back to this. So this is one kernel, right? Which leads to a feature map. But not, that's not the only kernel that you learn, you know? You learn this kernel, you also le learn this kernel. And you may also learn a kernel with different size. You may also learn a kernel which has a different size, right? So basically, uh, Basically, from this layer to the next layer, I have this feature map, which generated by the first kernel. And I have a second feature map, which is generated by the second kernel. And I have the third <laughs> okay, and then I have another feature map, and another feature map, and another feature map. We usually learn many kernels from one layer to another layer, okay? And I don't have a matrix here. In fact, I have a tensor. There are many of them. And then from this layer to the next layer, when you want to convolve again a kernel, <clears throat> say for example, if you had a feature map, it was, and you want to convolve it with a three by three kernel. But what you have learned from the previous layer is a tensor, it's not a matrix, you learn many feature maps. You basically convolve three by three times the number of feature maps that you learned. You know, it's again a tensor. It's not a matrix. Your signal is a tensor. And 
then you are going to have many of these. Three by three by, say for example, you have 10 features, three by three by 10, or three by three to what, 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 whatever number. And then you're gonna have 20 of them, you're gonna have 15 of them, and so on and so forth. You can imagine that uh, even if your data is not in, in a very high dimensional space, you have many values here in your feature maps because you're learning many kernels, right? So uh, finding a way for computational efficiency would be important. And I think the main motivation for uh, pooling was computer, computational efficiency. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So um, this is, for example, max pooling, as I told you, which is uh, popular and max pooling with downsampling. Uh, one side, say, uh, product of this pooling, yes. The, yeah, good question. Who can answer this question? Let me ask, ask you another question. ReLU is not continuous function, right? I mean, at, at zero. How do you take derivative of zero? Uh, uh, ReLU. Yes, but mathematically speaking, the function doesn't have derivative, right? But mathematically, it has subderivative. You know, your function has subderivative, and then you can calculate. Uh, and subderivative basically. Uh, without without technical basically wording means that uh, you know I don't know what the derivative at the point zero is, and you assume that point zero belongs to this part of the function or that part of the function, and you take you assume that the derivative of this is going to be either zero or is going to be one, right? But what about here? What about max pooling? Sorry? Do we need to take the derivative of that? In back propagation. You know, I have this feature. I have taken the max here and then and back propagation. Just back propagation. Sorry? Just back propagation. The max, the max slope. Mm -hmm. That you can see about how. Just only the max y count to the result. Mm -hmm. So only the root of the max value that is back propagation. Okay. You know, think about L2 max three popular um, operator here. And think if you do back propagation, uh, do you need derivative of them or you don't? And if you do, how do you do that? Think about this, we'll discuss this further. Think about these three, L2, average, and uh, max. Okay, so a, a side product of uh, pooling and translation is that pooling makes your network invariant with respect to a small translation. It's not in fact invariant, it's invariant to a small translation. So what 
what does it mean? This is detect the output of detector stage. And the output of detector stage is 0 0.1, 1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. Suppose that I do translation. I shift everything forward. And this 0 0.1 becomes 0 0.3. And this 0 0.1 goes to the next one, next one, next one. So I'm going to have this. And then I do max pooling. Okay. Um, if you compare this with this one, every single element has changed, right? That was 0 0.1, this is 0 0.3. That was 1, this is 0 0.1. 0 0.2, 1. If you look at this one after pooling, that was 1, it's 0 0.3 now. That was 1, it's still 1. 1, 1, 0 0.2, 1. So in, in this stage, with small translation, everything changed. But here, with a small translation, only half of the nodes have changed. Okay. So as if I'm invariant with respect to a small translation, you know, if, if something locally changed the output will not change okay so if 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 you are detecting this this image two and instead of observing this two you observe a translation of this two it's slightly to the right left or up down a still network is able to detect it right because the values after pulling a stage will not change um, so it's it's one advantage of pulling. Um, another advantage of pulling is that it facilitates you know some tool actually to work with data with varying size. Usually in machine learning algorithm, we assume that the, the size of data is the same, right? All of them are in d-dimensional space. But suppose that that's not the case. Some of the images are larger, some of the images are smaller. And uh, if I have, uh, you know, a pretty large feature map, for example, here, and I can say that, you know, I divide it to the four, uh, basically, parts, and then I take the max of each part. So it's going to be four by four. And even if it's smaller, I will do the same thing. And if it's very larger than this, I do the same thing. So after pulling, I can make the size of all of them the same, right? So uh, I can work with data with varying size. And by pulling, by down sampling, basically make them uh, having similar size. Uh, <clears throat> OK. Uh, the uh, idea of a sparsity can be interpreted as, with, with some sort of Bayesian approach, can be interpreted as having uh, infinitely strong priors on some weights. Okay? So uh, if you're a frequentist, then you uh, penalize, I mean, you do regularization. If you're Bayesian, you don't do regularization, you, you define priors. You know, I want to learn a Gaussian, I have a date. I want to learn the Gaussian. If I'm through Cantus, I do maximum likelihood, and maximum likelihood estimation of the first moment is just uh, average, you know mu is the average, and the second one is, you know, the formula that we have for a second. But if you are Bayesian, that's not the way that you uh, deal with this. You know, you assume that, okay, I have two parameters, and I have to learn these two parameters. I have to define a prior for these parameters. And for example, I can define, you know, the, 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 the prior of these parameters to be a Gaussian. 
So I, I define a prior for my parameters first, and then I calculate the posterior of that. So when I define a prior, this could be uh, a weak prior or a strong prior. You know, I can define a weak prior means that, okay, I would say that this mean going to be possibly here or somewhere along the way. But if it's a strong prior, I'm pretty certain that it's pretty close to this point. And I put a strictly or almost practically zero weight to other part of the space. So <clears throat> you can think of convolutional neural network as a feedforward neural network with a strong, with infinitely strong priors on, on, on weights that uh, as if I have a strong prior here that this weight is zero and most of the time and could have value in just, you know, small area. Um, can also think of this as having some sort of regularization, you know, as if you're adding some L1 norm for, to fit forward neural network optimization and make some of them zero. Except that if you add L1 norm, you don't have you don't share them, you know. You have another need, another constraint to share the weights as well. What with L1 uh, norm regularization, you can force many of them to be zero. And with infinitely strong priors on some of them, in some sort of Bayesian estimation, you can force many of them to be zero. That's not how we implement convolutional neural network in practice. That's just to give insight of what's happening in a uh, convolutional neural network. Okay, uh, some uh, some practical issues. Uh, I mentioned about having this tensors. And, uh, you know, suppose that you have an image. If it's a black and white image, you know, we can represent it with a matrix. But if it's uh, not black and white, it's a colored image. Usually we have three channels of green, red, and uh, blue, right? So basically the image is not just a matrix, is Uh, like three matrices, so it is a vector. Uh, sorry, it is a tensor, right? And then you when you convolve a kernel to this, it's not just a matrix that you're convolving with this. So it is if it is say for example five by five, in pra in practice it's going to be five by five by three. So your kernel is a tensor. And to make it even more interesting, if you are interested in tensors, we are looking, usually work with batches of data, right? Not with a single data point, so a batch of data. So you have M of them. So it's in fact a four-dimensional tensors, tensor, right? And that, that's the reason that when people usually working with, uh, I mean, plotting or have a figure of a structure of convolutional neural network, they show some tensors in different layers. That's the reason. Okay, so the, from the input, you have tensors. And then I told you that from one layer to another layer, you don't have one kernel, you have many kernels. So it leads to another tensor, another tensor, and so on. So at the end, you want to do classification, for example. Okay. 
how do you do classification at the end? I want to decide that it's this class or that class. Usually, I mean, when, we, when I say usually, that was the practice originally, but we have other structures now as well. So usually, you flatten all of these at the end, you know. I have, I have a, a, a tensor, and I flatten this. The way that we flatten a matrix, you know, to flatten a matrix, you know, we concatenate it all. Uh, columns together and made a, a vector. So you flatten this and make a vector, a large vector, and then you pass this vector to one layer, one dense layer, similar to fit forward. And this one dense layer decide uh, the, the, the class identity. Uh, okay. There are a couple of things, some of them are common in practice, some of them are not common in practice, but they're interesting facts about neural network and convolutional neural network and could be interesting ideas for research as well. So uh, there are ideas or algorithms of convolutional neural networks with a random kernel. So you don't learn kernels. In back using back propagation, you just randomly assign some values for the kernel, okay? Except for the last couple of layers. If you have many layers, you just randomly assign some values for kernels. And at the end, you uh, just learn kernels, okay? So it's doesn't seem something like sound, you know, to just, because what, what, what these kernels are, you know, the kernel we started, in, in the first example, I had a kernel that manually designed to detect edges. In convolutional neural network, we do not design kernels manually. We let the network, we let the algorithm to decide I have a classification problem. I want to make distinction between two and three. Kernels are parameters, true back propagation. I learned the kernel means the, the network decided what feature would be a distinctive feature for making distinction between two and three. So designing a kernel through back propagation which make this distinction, right? So, but now, all of a sudden, I would say that, okay, forget about this, just assign some random weights. Why it works? Actually, it doesn't work as good as learning, but it, in some cases, it works surprisingly well because it, since it's just random, you think that it shouldn't do anything, you know? but it does something useful. Why? Any idea? Yes. Is it still something consistent? Like if you're using a kernel of random values, is it still going to be something consistent across like your entire image when you're passing this kernel along it? Mm -hmm. um, so it'll still learn something. So learn something, yes. Okay, before you would think about this, let me ask you another question. You know, I have uh, some data points. And... Uh, It's in d-dimensional space, okay? I want to multiply this data. So it's say, for example, this d by one. And I want to multiply it to a matrix p by d. And get another vector, which is p by one, okay? Let me call this y. And let me call this x. And this is just uh, a transformation, a matrix. I'm looking for a transformation that when applied to n data points, I have n data points. Pairwise distances between points are preserved. 
means the distance between x1 and x2 is the same as distance between y1 and y2. And x1 and xj, xi and xj, the distance is the same as yi and yj. It may not be possible to preserve it, I mean to have it exactly the same because we are in two-dimensional space, the d dimension go to p dimension, but approximately I want to preserve that. What is the solution, what the t is? Which transformation preserves the distances for? You, you all know that transformation. No, it's going to p-dimensional. I mean, if it was the same dimension, it could be rotation, it could be translation, but I'm going to lower dimensional space or different dimensional space. This is PCA, right? PCA has many properties, and one of the properties is that if you want to go from p-dimensional, d-dimensional space to p-dimensional space and preserve the uh, distances, the optimum solution, the best thing you can do is to do PCA. In fact, you know, the algorithm to preserve distances is multidimensional scaling, MDS. But multidimensional scaling, when you are working on Euclidean space, Euclidean distance, sorry, when, when your distance is Euclidean distance, is PCA. Okay. So this is the, the optimum solution is PC. So the best thing that you can do is to find the covariance matrix of X and then find the eigenvalues and then make this transformation. Okay. That's the optimum solution. You can't do better than that. Okay, suppose that instead of this optimum solution, I'm going to randomly select some numbers from Gaussian and put it here. So what's going to happen in terms of these pairwise distances? What do you expect? It's completely random. Sorry? Yes, it did. I mean, intuitively, it seems that it's going to be a disaster, you know? Select some points randomly and multiply points randomly to some, I mean, you make a random transformation. So, intuitively, it seems that it should be a disaster, it shouldn't preserve the distance between points. But in fact, it works surprisingly well, not with all random distribution. It works with Gaussian, it works with Bernoulli, that uh, the resulting projection preserve the distances with up to some bound, which is not that bad. Okay? So, and there are many algorithms based on random projection. Um, in terms of convolutional neural network, if you choose the kernels randomly, as you said, it's going to learn something, right? Some similarities between everywhere in the image. It's going to be similar to this random feature that I have chosen. But think about this. If you're in high dimensional space, two random vectors most likely are going to be orthogonal to each other. Okay, Most likely two random vectors in high dimensional space are going to be orthogonal to each other. It means that I randomly choose a kernel and learn some features. And then I randomly choose another kernel and learn features. So most likely these two set of features are going to be independent from each other. You know? They're not redundant features. So with each random set of kernels, I learn some features of the data, which is different from the other one. And this random is not, what, what I learn 
you can think of this as just linear random projection in, in the first place. And uh, if it's linear random projection, it's distance preserving. As if I'm applying some sort of approximation of PCA to the data. Okay? But in fact, you have a nonlinearity as well. It's not a linear random projection. It's nonlinear random projection. And nonlinear random projection is quite complicated. We don't know ex exactly what's going to happen. But there are some theoretical works similar to this work that has been done for linear case. There are some theoretical works that has been done for nonlinear cases, including a work which shows that if your problem is classification and you're doing nonlinear random projection to the point, and your measure of similarity is cosine, not Euclidean distance, then the cosine similarity between members of classes get smaller and cosine similarity between members of different classes get larger. Means nonlinear random projection on the data makes two classes far apart in terms of cosine similarity and make them uh, shrink or collapse in terms of uh, cosine similarity. So, uh, definitely it's not going to be as good as a network that you learn, but it, it could be useful in cases uh, that, say for example, you want to decide about the structure of the network. I'm not sure that should I use 10 layers or 20 layers or 8 kernels or 20 kernels or 3 by 3 or 5 by 5, right? I have many choices, many uh, parameters to think about. So one approach could be to set them randomly. I mean, make the structure, but set the weights randomly instead of learning them because learning is time consuming. And then decide about the structure and then learn the structure using backpropagation. Okay? Um, also, it could be pretty interesting research direction to improve this random, randomly learned networks, you know. Can I learn, improve the, these type of networks that in a step back propagation, I just assign some random way. It's going to be much more efficient, right, if, if you can improve the uh, performance of them. Also, there are approaches that uh, um, learn the weights or learn the kernels through unsupervised techniques. You know, when you do backpropagation, it's supervised. You, are back pro you do backpropagation from your loss. So you know the label of the data and you s learn some features corresponding to that uh, target <coughs> variable. But there are approaches which tries to learn some features, some kernels un in, in, in an unsupervised manner. And for example, I have an image Uh, that's one approach, you know. I can make patches of this image, and these patches could be overlapping patches. And then I have many patches. Suppose that this is your data set, do PCA on it. And PCA is unsupervised, right? Do PCA on it, and then use that, use the eigenphase of this PCA as, eigenphase is just basically this, you know, the eigenvalue when you uh, visualize it, right? So use the, this eigenface as your kernel, okay? These are approaches with this taste, basically, you know? Okay, uh, our time is almost up and just I want to mention that there, uh, you know, that was convolutional neural networks. There are many uh, structures built up in convolutional neural network, which is pretty popular in the literature. Of uh, you can, you will hear many of these names: ResNet, uh, DenseNet, EfficientNet. You know, and uh, just to quickly mention ResNet is basically a type of convolutional neural network 
that has a residual connection. A residual connection means that you know you, you usually have this path between layers, and in this is resonant, you have a connection which skip layers, one layer. So if if the input is x to get here, you know usually x should go through this layer, and the output of this layer go to another layer, and so on. But here, in this, in addition to this path, you have another path which skip this path. So the, the output would be the original x plus f of x when f of x is built up in this, uh, I mean, using this layer. So the advantage is that when you do back propagation, you know, there's a problem of uh, vanishing gradient. And uh, basically, it avoid or it helps to avoid the problem of vanishing gradient you have another passive information as well, right? Which basically goes through directly. Uh, it's, or another intuition about resonant is that if you have this as in your input and as the output you want to have still access to your original input, you know, even you did some sort of transformation, but the final output is the original input plus this transformation. And then if true back propagation, you have problem with fixing this parameters of this F, you don't do something uh, completely unreasonable because you do have in access to X, right? So derivative through this residual pass would be one. You know, you don't lose information completely here. So ResNet proposed in 2015, and they made huge network with many layers by this trick. And then there are other structures like uh, dense net, when this connection is not just for to, to pass one layer, it's from one layer to many other layers and there's efficient net, and there are many of these type of variations that you can see yourself in the literature, and there are huge models that have been trained by this type of tricks. Any question? Okay, see you next week.